Hello, folks. We are back on World War Two TV. Uh, halfway, no, over halfway through Tank Destroyers Week. Will we get any closer to un answering the question of what exactly is a tank destroyer? Probably not, but we'll have fun getting there. My guest today, something of a legend on YouTube. I'm a mini legend. He's a big legend. Uh, the Chieftain uh, is joining us now from the States, and we're going to talk about tank destroyers. So good afternoon, sir. How are you today? Well enough, uh, although the, you know, he's setting ridiculously high expectations for me now. Well, you, you, you come with a reputation. So, I mean, we'll start with a question. Is it easy to define for you sitting there what a tank destroyer is, or is it a fluid um, thing that depends on situations? But you're looking at your doctrinal term versus the mechanical term. I mean, a mechanical term, is, as far as I'm concerned, any vehicle whose per primary designed purpose is to destroy enemy armor. Uh, the doctrinal term, uh, that depends what your doctrine is. So in World War II, a tank destroyer was a piece of equipment uh, or a unit uh, which was designed to be held in reserve and used en masse against enemy armor. And because American tank destroyers included towed guns, but not all towed guns were tank destroyers. So the uh, like the the 57 millimeter anti-tank gun that was a standard anti-tank gun of the U.S. Army, that wasn't a tank destroyer. That was an anti-tank gun. Yeah, if you look at a picture of a 57 millimeter and a picture of a three inch uh, tank destroyer, which are both towed guns with a split yeah. trail and wheels on the side and a bunch of guys standing behind shoving rounds into it, you, you're they're going. What what the hell's the practical difference? So uh, that, that's where you have your, your doctrinal versus uh, mechanical uh, ideas. And it came up yesterday and, and you disagreed. One of the viewers, I think it was Lance, said, is it a job description? Is Tank Destroyer actually a job description rather than a description of the vehicle? I, I think the, the difference was that he was saying, well, if it was, pre if it was pressed into service as a Tank Destroyer, does it become a tank destroyer? I don't think so. Any more than a tank destroyer, which is pressed in the surface as a tank, becomes a tank. Uh, I mean, yeah. you, you, or, oh, I've got a, I don't know, an F, if you stick an F-22 Lightning and you stick a couple of bombs under the under the wings, has you, have you suddenly turned it into a ground attack aircraft or is it basically a fighter that you just hung a couple of bombs under? Yeah. Yeah. Or in, in a simple term, is a log over a ditch that becomes a bridge, a bridge, or is it still just a log? You know, it's 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 both and neither. But you wanted to start back with Germany in the 1920s, because when we're talking about armored vehicles, kind of Germany in World War II looms large and everything, because are they leading the way? Are they copying it? But, you know, you can't talk about armor in World War II without referencing the Germans. So we'll hand it over to you to kind but, of start. But, us but, but I wanted to start, yeah. So I wanted to start with Germany, not because they were the ones that came up with the tanks, but because they were the ones that came up, as near as I can tell, with the earliest use of the term tank destroyer, uh, which in German, oddly enough, is a tank zerstorer. Uh, if you'll pronounce, forgive my German pronouncing, but you know, T A N K Z E R S T O E R E R, literally tank destroyer. And I, I'm doing a little bit of speculating here, uh, but I, I, I think the reason that the Germans were the first that I could found to use this term is that you know, after World War I, the Germans are there preparing their army for, the, for the, whatever the next fight is, except they're not allowed to have tanks, but everybody else has tanks. Hmm. So the, the the question of well, what the hell do we do about these tanks is um, is fairly much in their mind, and they're they're already giving a little bit more uh, thought to the problem. I think than most of the other countries, because I mean, who who else has tanks? The, the Allies and Britain isn't talking about going to war with France in the next ten years, and the Americans are talking. You know, no, nobody else has tanks that, that anybody else is worried about. So why not uh, why not look at Germany and, and see what their problem is? And they had, uh, I mean, okay, you, you start off with the original response that they, they had to tanks was simply, well, you take your 7.5 or 7.7 .7 centimeter gun, you point it horizontally at a big tank, and you pull the trigger, and in, in fairness, it would do a number on any Allied tank at the time. Or then eventually you start with the, uh, the high-velocity rounds. But in 1926 is when they, they really set out to make an anti-tank gun, uh, the tank of wear canon, uh, the TAK. And it was a 3.7 centimeter L45. And very quickly, uh, they, they started asking the question, well, hang on a second. So this thing is towed. Do we want to stick it on something to make it a self-propelled tack? 
And so I'm, I'm going to start off. Um, I, I don't do PowerPoints very well because it has take forever. And I'm actually going to be doing a fair bit of reading, uh, particularly from Panzer Tracts. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if you're not familiar with Panzer Tracts, you should be. They're basically the gold standard on German vehicle design, uh, written by uh, Hilary Dahlpanzer uh, and uh, Tom Sienz, who were themselves disciples of Spielberger. And if you don't have a, you know, a couple of Spielberger books hanging around in your shelf. What do you What are you doing, calling yourself a uh, a tank enthusiast? So um, th there's uh, a, there was some debate that the Germans are having. And just how big an anti tank gun do we need? Do we need a three point seven? Do we need a five centimeter? Do we need a seven point five? And the end result was that they decided, you know, we'll only do the three point seven. It's not worth it. Uh, it's too unwieldy. Anything medium or light enemy tanks, we can kill with a 3.7 up to like 1,500 meters. And uh, if it really is a heavy, heavy tank, uh, and again, we're talking mid-1920s here, so a heavy tank, we're not talking Char 2C. Well, maybe we are. But the average heavy tank, uh, well, that would be like they did in World War One. They would get a regular big artillery piece aim it horizontally and fire away. And uh, so 1927, so about a year later, uh, they start looking at tanks or stores uh, on a, basically what, what we're looking at here is a, no, it's an agricultural tractor basically with a 3.7 yep. stuck on top, a tack gun stuck on, stuck on top. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading a couple of excerpts from the way that they are, they were thinking. Uh, and there, there's a couple of reasons I want to do this. The first is the, the relevance to the American tank destroyer philosophy that gets a lot of flack. And uh, you'll, you'll soon see that the Americans were not out there. They're actually following very closely in the German philosophy of the time. They were actually the German philosophy of, of a few years prior, because the Germans had a head start on this, and the Americans were catching up. So, be, be it in a uh, a case of convergent evolution or parallel evolution, or the Americans just stole the idea of the Germans, uh, that you you're going to see the similarity. And the other thing is, it's quite possible that they did steal off the Germans. So, for example, I was looking in the archives. I saw a document uh, from uh, it was a report from Germany. And remember, in the 1930s, the U.S. Army, together with a number of other armies, were sending officers on exchange, and we'll even do it today, to the Kriegs Academy. And as part of the curriculum of the Kriegs Academy, you have to do a little bit of time in a field unit. And there was one report, 1939 this was, uh, of a U.S. Army captain who had been assigned to a uh, Panzer Jaeger company. And so he's trained in all the, all the latest thinking of the, the German anti-tank doctrine, and he comes back to the U.S. 1939, he writes his report, and, and, and it gets sent off. Obviously, it wasn't thrown away because he found it in the archives. Um, uh, oh, uh, just looking into text, uh, Panzer Tracks has been, uh, this, it's now being sold or distributed by Panzer Rex, uh, Leo for Panzer Rex, he's uh, in the U.K., uh, that announcement was made a couple of months ago. So if, you, if you're looking for uh, Panzer Tracks, uh, you have, have a look at the Panzer X site. Anyway, uh, so 1927, the chef, there's Harris Waffenam, so the head of the, the armament procurement, recorded his position on tank destroyers, uh, on, on the type of tank abwehr Waffa that was needed. And uh, I'll, I'll just say, until the 1930s, it was called TAC, or Tank Abwehr Kanon. Uh, the term Panzer of Werkanon doesn't seem to have come about until the Germans actually started setting up Panzer troops of their own. And I guess they just wanted to keep the, uh, the terminology the same. But everybody was calling them tanks, so the Germans called them a tank, uh, uh, tank of Werkanon. Tank assist stores are the most effective weapon against tanks. They should be full tracked or wheel come tracked self propelled guns with the lowest possible height and the highest possible speed. Uh, they must take advantage of tactical weakness of a tank by mobile fighting. If possible, striking in the flank or rear. This will always force the tank attack to turn aside. It seems to me that as a story battery of 12 Geschützen is needed for each division. 
The 3.7 centimeter cannon uh, can be the gun mounted in the store, has high penetrating power, high rate of fire, a large number of rounds can be carried. Observation of shots must be possible out to a range of about 2,000 meters. Now, part of, part of the problem was that the tracer burnout was less than 2,000 meters. In my opinion, a horse drawn or a towed 3.7 centimeter tack will not be a usable weapon for the infantry. In time of crises, either the guns won't be where they are needed or they will be available in such small numbers that they won't be effective. Against a modern tank attack, it is proposed that a tank destroyer of Raupen be developed with a 3.7 centimeter gun. So initially, we're coming right off the question of, uh, do they have to be fast or heavily armored? And he's going with, they have to be fast. Are they to be spread out? Are they to be used en masse? And he says, well, they got to be used en masse. So immediately, we're starting to see a little bit of similarity between yeah. uh, you know what, what the Germans are doing, what the uh, what the uh, Americans come up with. So they they have a have a couple of tries that, that their problem was actually creating a good tanks to store chassis, and they tried uh, the, you know the, the photo I saw earlier. Uh, they also tried, uh, especially they will the tanks. You are familiar with the uh, the life detractor. That is officially and a tank destroyer. It is the uh, Licht tractor, high metal, subsphere uh, three point seven centimeter, uh, uh, sorry, Kampfwagen of where subsphere So uh, basically, a destroyer vehicle uh, with the three point seven centimeter tack gun. Uh, again, it didn't work out. Uh, they actually tried putting, they debated putting a seven point five on there as well, but you know, it's, the vehicle is way to hell uh, to um, do small. So the the Germans again also then the then the recession hits and or the Great Depression whatever you know, the, the Germans cut back a little bit on vehicle development as well. Uh, so 1930, no, 1935, um, a report is uh, submitted. Uh, it's entitled "Offensive Abwehr von Panzerwagen" or offensive defense against tanks and I, again I'm, re I'm reading i'm reading from uh, panzer tracks and one of the principles that they have if they didn't themselves see this in the archive it doesn't get printed in their books um during the demonstration at kummersdorf on 11 july 35 the oberkommando des Harris himself emphasized that an offensive tank defense must be strived for the following statements about technical development have resulted from thoroughly working through the problem. The frequently expressed principle that the best defense against the tank is another tank is at least disputed. Mm -hmm. Bomber aircraft are not employed against heavy bomber aircraft. Instead, faster, more maneuverable fighter aircraft presenting a smaller target are used that only have to be armed in such a way that they can really damage a bomber. At sea, the torpedo boat is fought with a torpedo boat destroyer, the submarine with a submarine destroyer. In both types of destroyers, the most important specification is superior speed and maneuverability, armored only as far as it doesn't interfere with those primary characteristics. Uh, recently, this train of thought by many sailors has reached its peak in the Schnell boat. Uh, apparently, even against the heaviest and largest warships, the Schnell boat is a valuable and dangerous offensive weapon. They are small targets, uh, yada, yada, yada. Uh, armor is practically renounced. Uh, they have fulfilled their role if they can get within effective torpedo firing range undamaged. Even if they are destroyed after achieving their task, their employment is worthwhile, even if for purely from a, an economic standpoint. Now, this is, uh, you go over top of track. We're talking the Jeune Nicole here, mm -hmm. uh, which has since been discredited. But that doesn't mean to say that it wasn't a very legitimate and followed line of thinking. So um, the question remains whether a tank destroyer can be built exactly corresponding to the fighter aircraft, torpedo boat destroyer, submarine destroyer, and especially the Schnell boat, in which armor is rejected in favor of the following primary characteristics. One, very high road speed to achieve good operational mobility. Two, good cross-country mobility, at least the same as tanks. Three, cross-country speed and maneuverability greatly superior to a tank. Uh, four, small target area. Five, good firing platform for accurate shooting. Uh, six, weapons capable of target destruction at ranges from 700 meters up. Uh, cheap and quick mass production in comparison to tanks. Uh, eight, if possible, without interfering with the first seven requirements, rapidly dismantable weapon 
for the purpose of employment in the same way as towed anti-tank guns. And if you look at all these requirements and the logic behind them, this is exactly what is going through American minds about 1940, 1941. And so this was six years earlier. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to skip over much of the rest of that, uh, but there are a couple of extra things here. Um, so uh, th there was an attempt for a Zugkraft wagon Fergustel with the engine in the rear, maximum speed sixty to seventy kmh. Uh, high road speed, more than double that of a tank, allows anti-tank units to be rapidly sent to threatened sectors. Its cross-country speed and mobility are also superior to that of tanks. Um, so what they started doing at that point was they started doing uh, their tank destroyers on half tracks. So they would look, if you can see the picture, something akin to this, a half track yeah, yeah. with a turret gun on top. And they made a number of them. So that first one was a, three point, a very long 3.7. This is a 7.5. Uh, another 7.5 variant. And we're talking, again, early war here. Uh, one of the requirements for the 7.5 was the, the, the new battery of uh, heavy French tanks. And you get to the point that uh, the self sphere la fête soi, the, the 7.5 centimeter cannon, they actually built a couple of them, they sent them to combat in North Africa. Again, half-track tank destroyer designed with the primary purpose of engaging enemy armor on a lightly armored vehicle with a 360 degree traverse and an open top. So I'm going to skip forward a little bit here. I'm going to come back to the to the 8.8 .8 in a little bit. Uh, but I'm going to skip forward to the Panzer Jaeger 1. And again, I'm, I'm going to read from the manual. This is from the tactics manual, Merkeblatt, uh, 28 uh, slash 1 uh, of 1940. And as I read through this, bear in mind how this applies to American tank destroyers with one exception. And the Americans tend to be going one level higher. So where the Germans are talking about companies, the Americans are talking about battalions. Where the Germans are talking about uh, platoons, the Americans are talking about companies and so on. Uh, Schneller Panzerjäger are unique in their continual readiness to fire high cross-country mobility and armor protection. They are thus qualified to combat enemy tanks by attacking. Unhindered observation with an open top allows early recognition and engagements of enemy tanks which have limited vision. Uh, the Schnell of Panzerjäger at Thailand or Harris Truppen, as a rule, they will be attached to Panzer Division. Uh, the combat unit is the company. Uh, they will receive instructions from the Thailand commander. Employment of the entire Thailand as a single unit can be useful in many situations. So again, the, the Americans prefer to do battalions by the default, by doctrine. Now what actually happened versus by doctrine yeah, is two yeah. entirely different things, but by doctrine, the Americans wanted to do entirely by battalions and a battalion to a division. Uh, the employment of a single platoon by itself should be seldom. Uh, the decisive elements for successful action are timely recognition and determining the number and direction of attacking enemy tanks, Utilizing terrain to advantage, rapid handling. Uh, combat will be conducted by fire and movement. The purpose is to surprise enemy tanks. Um, uh, the task of uh, frontal advance Prenzjäger is to halt the enemy. Uh, when engaged by superior enemy fire, the Panzerjäger are to use their high speed to change positions. Uh, then you go down to the employment of the actual battalion. The, the role of the battalion, and, and again, if you look up FM 18-5, the American Tank Destroyer Manual, it's like copied word for word almost. Um, the role of the Chanel Panzer Jäger at Pailung within a Panzer Division on the march is to protect the front and flanks of the marching columns. Um, infantry will skip over. Uh, when the advancing unit deploys, the entire Abteilung advances by bounds as directed when attacking within a Panzer Division. As a rule, the Abteilung will be assigned to the uh, Panzer Brigade. It is tasked with securing the flanks and assisting in the, of, of the destruction of attacking enemy tanks. Uh, when the objective is reached or the advance is halted, the Panzer Jäger are to guard the assembled Panzer units. Um, 
And again, when you're looking on the defense, uh, on the defense, the Chanel and Panzer Jäger of Thailand are held in reserve. They will not be sent into action until the direction of the enemy tank attack is clearly identified. Their task is to destroy the enemy tanks that have penetrated the main battlefield. If enemy tanks have broken through, Chanel and Panzer Jäger units are to cut off the breakthrough and then sent in to destroy the enemy tanks. This is no way different to the way the Americans had, had intended the tank destroyers to be used. Now, can, uh, can I ask a couple of questions? Just, yeah. It seems so far, in what you read out from the German side of things, they're just lumping enemy tanks into one type. When we know that in the 30s, there's infantry tanks and cruisers and light tanks and heavy tanks and tanks are being used for different purposes. And you just said there, you know, the enemy tanks breaking through. So are the Germans at this point kind of guilty, maybe not the right word, of thinking about how they're going to be using tanks and not necessarily acknowledging how enemies they may be engaging may be using tanks. Does that make sense, that question? Well, it doesn't say tanks that are broken through on their own. It just yeah. says tanks that are broken through, be they in company with uh, infantry, like let's say the, the French, or be they on their own, like the uh, the DD tanks that the, uh, that the Soviets were playing with for their deep battle concepts. Um, when it comes down to the weapons, well, that, that's why you have some weapons that are bigger guns. And uh, if you look at, uh, for the invasion of France, because obviously they, they realized that well, the French had some pretty hefty, uh, pretty hefty uh, tanks. Uh, they had a couple of things. First, a number of the, the pack battalions had 8.8 .8 centimeter guns. Most of them were towed, but there was one, uh, there was one battalion that was uh, self-propelled of 8.8 on half tracks. And uh, you know, the troops liked the vehicle so much that it was continuously called upon to help, especially to be employed against bunkers. Uh, over 21 days in the invasion of Poland, one crew had traveled uh, about 6,000 kilometers. Wow. Uh, th this is the 8.8 uh, the on the half track there, the 12 kilometer. So uh, they were originally developed as bunker busters. And somebody realized, well, hell, you, you, you're putting a, an armor piercing shell basically into an 8.8. .8. If it'll do a number on a bunker, it will probably also do a number on a French tank. Uh, so there was that, and they also had fairly good hopes for the uh, the 4.7 centimeter, the Czech gun that was being mounted on the Panzer Jäger one, uh, was deemed to be effective enough against the French tanks as well. In most cases, they probably were. Uh, but you, know, you you got this myth that's out there that oh Rommel decided to take the 8.8 .8 at Arras and point it sideways, and he converted the 8.8 .8 into an anti tank gun, and that that's total BS. Uh, he may have commandeered an 8.8 .8 unit, but they were already well equipped and trained to yep. uh, to, to do. We that. we like debunking Rommel claims. That's yeah, that's fantastic. That's 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 um, nectar <laughs> to the gods to me. Yeah. So uh, ba basically, anyway. So wh where are you going with this? Is this is a, a either depending how you want to look at it, it's either confirming evidence that the Americans were not completely off base with their theories. Right, uh, or it's evidence that there there, there was cross pollination uh, between the one and the other. Hey, bugs, how are you? Um, so I thought anyway I would start with that before going on to uh, to later things or the Americans. Does yeah, I mean, mean we, we said we could just do it a bit free form, and there's questions coming in already. So so just to kind of recap, the what we're saying is the American and German doctrines are starting in a broadly similar place albeit not quite at the same time and we've sort of determined this week that by the end of world war ii the armies are more or less in the same kind of place with what they're expecting out of tank destroyers sort of it's the middle part of the war where things diverge quite considerably with the italians and things we were talking about last night but um yeah, yeah that, that let you talk about what you want to talk about or do you want to do some questions? recommend you go back to it um, so what what I, what I haven't entirely figured out yet is, and, and in fairness, this is for me for not just asking the people who know, like uh, Doyle Raps or maybe Bernard, um, how much did the political interference in Germany affect uh, what were the, the German anti-tank units? So you had uh, Pete two days ago talking about the Sturmgeschütze and, and how they were converted to become Panzerjäger. And uh, the one, one, one that he missed was the, the Egg Panther. There's documentation, again, on, in, in the books, 
where even the 8.8 .8 Jagdpanther was initially referred to as a uh, as a Sturmgeschutz. Mm. Uh, so when you have this guy in charge that has this bizarre idea that bigger is better and is just randomly dictating put an extra two centimeters of armor onto this vehicle. Uh, and then you also have folks like Adarian who you kind of look at something and go, oh, I'll, I'll have that. Thank you very much. I will turn that into a Panzer Jaeger. Regardless uh, of what the original concepts were, because vehicles like the the, the Hornissa, the, the Martyr, they didn't go away. They were still being built. So you now have a, suddenly a divergence within a, a German doctrine as to just what a tank destroyer is supposed to be. Is it supposed to be open top, fast, nippy, hit hard, and then escape? Or is it supposed to be sit in one place, ambush, slug it out, and then perform a counterattack? Uh, between you know, it's the Pan Jaeg Panzer versus uh, the Panzer Jaeger, basically, and I I have not seen why this split has happened. Now, usually, a, an army is going to come up with a doctrine and stick to it. Uh, the Americans didn't build any heavy tank destroyers. I don't think the British did either. Uh, the Soviets, I would well, the, the Soviet issue is that with the exception of the SU, uh, was it the SU-100? They didn't build tank destroyers at all. They just built self-propelled guns. Um, so no other no other army did what the Germans did in, in, in either hedging their bets, which is one possibility, or being so dysfunctional that they couldn't figure out what they wanted to do. And given how the German military tended to work, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule out dysfunctional. Um, what is the Hannan's razor? Ne never attribute to malice what uh, what incompetence can account for. It, 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 it's kind of like a derivative of Occam's razor, where the simplest solution is probably the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do I think of Rommel? I don't really think very much of him. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I don't think that he was bad. I just don't think about him very often. Uh, he's, I mean, he's, he, he dominates conversations where he doesn't need to. That that's it's it's. That's that's it's a rabbit hole we, we don't really want to go down to. But Rommel is a is a yeah. It, it, Rommel is introduced like Patton is introduced like Montgomery is introduced into subjects that don't need them to be discussed, in my opinion. And that doesn't mean they're not worthy of being dis discussed in other subjects, but they get brought into things that their involvement is minimal. That's kind of my statement on that. No, that that, that that's fair enough. All right, so let me grab one of my other books here. Sorry, sorry. <sighs> I'm going to do a bit of a plug. So it's coming back into print. It was out of print a little bit, but uh, I literally wrote the book on the development of American tank destroyers. Uh, Harry Yide wrote the book on the use of tank destroyers. Yep. And um, going back to your very early question as to just what the hell is a tank destroyer versus a light tank. So I'm going to scroll forward to um, the development of the 57 millimeter gun motor carriage T49 which eventually, after a couple of cycles, would become the M18. Um, da, da, da. Uh, okay, so if you look at the, the T49 as, original, as it was built, you're going to see that it has a coaxial machine, a coaxial machine gun and a hull machine gun. And uh, I don't know if this is going to come out, come out well, but you can see the, the, the point here where the hull machine gun would go or in the drawing, a whole machine gun, coaxial machine gun. And this thing weighs, let's say, 15 ton. Well, an M3 or an M5 Stewart has, has about 15 ton, has a coaxial machine gun, bow machine gun, and a main gun. So according to uh, General Christmas uh, of Ordnance Branch, uh, I understand there has been some talk about changing the name of the 57 millimeter gun motor carriage T-49 to a tank. I fully realize that we've got to win a war, and in fact, whether we call the thing a Tahuti or a tank or anything else isn't going to win the war. Uh, there is a little point, though, of primary interest and morale. I feel that our tank program is coming along in five shape, fine shape. Certainly, the M5 is a good tank. The M4 medium contains advanced thought. And the tank you were developed at Rock Island, which is about 20 tons, is an excellent product. That would be the M7, which turned out to be a complete disaster, but no matter. Um, in other words, the tank situation seems well in hand. To date, except for the T-22E2, which has been somewhat modified to make a reconnaissance vehicle, uh, so again, the MA armored car, the Greyhound, that was developed as a tank destroyer, a 37 millimeter gun motor carriage. And then they realized that the 37 millimeter was completely rubbish for, for the role at the time. They, they shopped it around and say, who wants it? Armored force says, oh, hey, we'll, we'll take it as a, uh, 
we'll take it as a, as a normal car. Um, so apart from this, we have no strictly newly developed tank destroyer weapons. I therefore would like to see the gun motor carriage name reserved for us, and that the Christie gun motor carriage development is primarily for tank destroyer purposes, both for mounting the 57 and possibly the three inch gun. Later, if this vehicle proves to be a better tank than what we have, well and good. We can't be dogs in the major, and of course, we will have to call it a tank and give it to armored force. In the meantime, however, I earnestly hope that we can concentrate in this mount for our own purposes. So uh, it, it's kind of so that even they were wondering, you know, are we making light tanks or are we making tank destroyers? And, well, I don't think that's why they deleted the co the two machine guns just so they can say we're not making a light tank. Uh, but it's it, it's one of those little little factors that's probably worth a bit of consideration. I mean, one uh, of the things we haven't talked about is just how cool the the, the phrase tank destroyer sounds. It somehow <laughs> conveys more than anti-tank gun, because anti-tank gun, something can be anti-something without being successful, can't it? You can be anti uh, a new law that's been passed, <coughs> and you can go and protest with two other people outside of parliament, but you don't make a difference. But destroying, a tank destroyer unit implies you are actually destroying tanks. So it, it obviously sounds really good. I always love bringing language into things. Well, I mean, um, have you ever noticed that it's not, called, it's not called air destruction artillery, it's air defense artillery? That's true. That they don't. Be, they don't care if they don't care if they kill the target. Well, they probably do care, but it's not important to their job. Their job is to defend against enemy aircraft. And if all they do is they make the uh, make the enemy aircraft decide to go somewhere else, they, they've done their job. That's true. Yeah, that that muddies the water slightly. Um, we'll do a couple of questions because they're in there. They're they're there. So history explorer is asking, and this has come up already. Do you think gunners make the best anti tank crew or tankers, or indeed in some cases with a towed uh, uh, tank destroyers? Infantry, because because all three have been involved uh, with 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 the tank destroyer role. What's your initial reaction to that? Well, it seems to me most logical that if if you have if you have spent time as the target, you know best the uh, the advantages and disadvantages of that particular target. But then again, taking a tanker and sticking him into an anti tank gun crew and not into a tank is a waste of the tanker's skills. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, if you if you look at how the Americans did it, they had their their TD school in Temple, and I mean, all they did was they trained TD stuff. Now, there is a reference in, I think it's the Infantry's Armor by Harry Yidey, of a unit of tanks in Italy uh, that hung out with a TD battalion for a couple of weeks, and apparently in tank school you didn't get a hell of a lot of anti tank train anti tank specific training. So they, they had a bit of an exchange program going on. And by the time the TD crewmen were finished training them, uh, this turned out to be one of the best anti-tank tank battalions in, in the American army in Italy. Uh, so it, it goes to show that there is definitely some advantage of not, not taking a tanker and assuming he's automatically going to be good at being an anti-tank guy uh, versus uh, taking a, a specially trained, I mean, he may not be the best tanker in the world, but by God, he knows how to kill tanks uh, sort of thing. Um, actually, another another difference now. Thinking about it, uh, I, I was before coming on, I was doing a little bit more randomly reading, and I was looking at a battle report on the Hornisse, uh, the German self-propelled 8.8. .8. Had two bombs. One, they wanted to stop making it because they couldn't figure out how to keep the sight aligned to the gun when the vehicle was was going cross country. The, the report basically said, "Yeah, it, it does fine in testing." Uh, at Kummersdorf, but as soon as you actually drive the thing in combat, your your gun and your sight don't point the same way anymore. But it took a very long time to fix that. Uh, but the other odd thing was uh, how many rounds of ammunition they were using to destroy tanks, and the fact that the Germans didn't have many rounds of ammunition to destroy tanks. So um, again, it's it's against the old book. It's uh, called the dreaded threat, the 8.8 .8 centimeter in the anti-tank role, and it goes over expenditure reports. And the and people oh the 8.8 .8 was a brilliant gun it, it would hit a tank sized target first time every time at a thousand yards yeah in combat it didn't do that you were looking at an average of 11 to 20 rounds per tank killed uh, for a couple of different reasons but uh, that, that was one of the things but uh, to compare the German statement in that battle report hey be very careful when you're firing at long range with the Hornisse. Uh, you were going to use your ammunition, which we don't have a hell of a lot of, 
and then comparing the ammunition expenditure reports that uh, the Americans were doing, where they would routinely fire two dozen, three dozen rounds to get a single kill, and they didn't care. Uh, it's yeah. got a, there, there was one example. That, oh, there was a uh, there was a German tank taking cover behind this building. So they simply fired about a dozen high explosive rounds to remove the building, and then they popped a couple of AP rounds into it. Uh, I, 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 can't, I can't imagine uh, the Germans were, were, would be able to do that sort of thing. Um, it's, uh, which, is, which is why comparing nations against each other based on either vehicles or doctrine, the variables of ammunition and the politics behind things is is all another another fact. We, we're going to do a few questions if you don't mind because they're, they're, they're coming in. I'm going to go back to the couple of ones that came in early on. Mad Cat is asking, were, were German tank destroyers a stopgap measure because of the appearance of the T-34 and KV-1 on the Eastern Front. And one of the things that hasn't come up yet much this week is the Eastern Front. Pete kind of stuck to the, the ETO and Yugoslavia a bit, and obviously Damien yesterday focused on North Africa. But how much does the Eastern Front uh, influence things genuinely with tank destroyer design? Or deployment? Or you? So one, one of the earlier TDs, per se, uh, that the, the Germans came up with wasn't actually a TD at all. It was the, it was the RSO with the Pac-40 on top. And it, it's basically an artillery tractor that they stuck a towed Pac-40 on, on top of a 360-degree traverse. And the reason they did that was quite simply, uh, it, they figured that if, if your gun, if your anti-tank gun weighs more than about a ton, uh, it's not a great towed anti-tank gun because you have to manhandle the thing which means either uh, it's too big to run away and reposition, it might be too big to hide uh, in concealment with the infantry, and in Russia or on the Russian front, when you have all that mud, if you're having enough trouble with a two-ton gun or a one-and-a-half-ton gun just pushing it in Western roads, imagine trying to push a Pac-40 through the mud. Mm. Uh, so the RSO was developed. And uh, that was one of the few uh, TDs or, or SPATDs, whatever you want to call it, uh, that the Germans developed that actually had the re that met the requirement for a 360 degree traverse. Uh, it was actually a requirement, but a lot of it was quite simply, we don't have the ability to make a bottom up uh, vehicle. We're just going to take what we can, bodge it, stick an anti tank gun on the top and, and, and hope for the best. And that brings us back to the point you made right at the beginning in those eight those eight points the Germans made in whatever year it was about them being cheaper than tanks, because that seems to have been another recurring theme is just regardless of the of the ability or functionality of of, of tank destroyers, stroke, self-propelled guns, if they're cheaper to produce and quicker to produce than tanks, that in itself is making them a useful item just be based on that. Correct. And, and that was, uh, I think it was McNair said it's some verbiage very similar to it is poor economy uh, to use a 20, you know, it was, it, was, it was a good economy to use a 20,000 ton anti tank gun against a $200,000 tank or $20,000 anti tank gun against yeah. $200,000, something of that nature. And yes, there are people involved in the cost, time, and money to train the crews and about 20, 20 years to build a crewman. Uh, on the other hand, it is an industrial war uh, on the national scale. And if they can make economies anywhere, then great. Now, of course, the question is, is it a false economy? Because now you have spent all this time and effort building vehicles whose job is to sit around in a battalion-sized organization per division and wait for the enemy to attack you. Uh, is that a good economy? That's arguable. On the other hand, when you do need one, such as at the Battle of the Bolts, such as at El Guitar or whatever, it's very handy to have these guys <laughs> that can very rapidly displace to the enemy point of penetration. So, you know, let, let's say that M18 tank destroyer battalion wasn't available to, to, to sweep into Bastogne before the, the Germans cut it off. Uh, would that have made a difference to, to the 101st? I, I submit, yes, it probably would. A, yep. a, a battalion of M18s is going to make a bit of a difference when being attacked by a whole bunch of tanks. Um, well, no, uh, quick, uh, quick answer uh, to uh, quick answer though to uh, Sam Thompson. April 29th and April 30th. Go to Fort Benning. They're opening up uh, for an open house. The museum there. Anyway, okay, continue. Thank you, thank you. Um, Br Brad from On This Day in History is asking your thoughts on the Archer. It's better than pushing a 17 pounder around through the mud. Um, 
I have to I have to get a little bit into the I I don't know off the top of my head which came first, the 17 pound of modification to the M10 or the Archer. Um I think we'll find that out tomorrow because PM Knight yeah. is on talking about the Crusader gun oh, oh, no. he, 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 He'll have that sorted out for you easily enough. Um, I personally think that the, the British might have missed the trick uh, with, with 70 pounder. They didn't get around to converting all their M10s to 17 pounder by the end of the war. Um, I think they would have done better to take some of those guns instead of putting them into Fireflies, putting them into the M10s on the basis that if you are going to make a tank killer, Make it the best damn tank killer you can. Don't make it a bodge like Firefly was. Uh, yeah. But I, I realize that my opinion on that is minority. I, I'm not a huge fan of Firefly per se. Uh, but anyway, no, I, I think I, I, Fireflies are great. But it just it it always I always <laughs> back off when I realize how much time it took and how much money it took to convert. You think that that again? It's not a. They worked, but it was maybe not the most economic use of the production and the time and things like that to get there. Something more purpose built would be better. But a question is I found it here from Gary asked one where the hell has it gone? Uh, I've got, I'll try and find it there. That's the problem with that. It's getting popular now. Um, here we go. Uh, Davis is already in January 43 when he was head of U.S. Armored Forces calling for 90 millimeter guns on tanks. I get the problems with this for tanks, but why not on tank destroyers until so late in the war? So 90 millimeters being, millimeters, ugh, millimeters being introduced earlier in tank destroyers. Okay, so the, first, the first 90 millimeter TD that the Americans came up with was the T-53. Uh, it was basically an M3 Grant with a pedestal mounted 90 millimeter on top of it. Go, go to Google, look, look up T-53 and T-53E1 um uh, and you'll you'll see the thing that was it's basically hideous uh wasn't wasn't going to work well as a td uh, they tried to say can we turn it into a sub anti aircraft gun the aa guys said hell no so that was the end of it until you get to the t71 which is the m36 so um the the timeline for the m36 was september 42 was um Okay, Ordnance Branch said it would be possible to place a 90 millimeter anti aircraft gun into tanks which were then using the three incher, i.e., the M10. Uh, the demonstration of a 90 millimeter in an M10 was in December 1942. Now, that, that wasn't the M36 turret. That was quite simply stick a 90 millimeter into the M10. Does the chassis fall apart? No? Okay, let's continue. Um, so. January 1943, uh, according to the uh, Subcommittee on Automotive Equipment, uh, the inclusion of the 90 millimeter appears to be a very simple problem of substituting the larger gun into the three inch gun cradle. It is considered highly desirable to develop the possibilities of the 90 millimeter gun onto the three inch gun motor carriage M10 in order that the potentials of the heavily weapon may be utilized and have on hand a weapon or the data necessary for rapid change to this weapon that will cope with any vehicles our enemies now have or will have by the time the weapon can be produced. So March 1943 is when they start the development officially of the T-71. Now, there were, there were two problems uh, with this. Uh, the, there were two groups of people that really objected to this 90 millimeter variant of the M10. The one group was the chief of engineers. Uh, the proposed vehicle exceeds the limitations now prescribed by AR850-15 in weight, width, and gross weight per foot of ground contact. Um, so basically, uh, there, the army had a regulation uh, basically saying this is how big you can have a vehicle in an infantry division versus an armor division versus whatever else. And you'll, you'll see that's mainly to do with engineers and bridges. Uh, and even if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the requirements, the design requirements for Panzer III, for example, it's, there's a lot of talk about, well, hell, our, our typical bridge is only 18 tons. Please don't make the Panzer III or the Panzer IV or anything much over 18 tons. Yeah, we've got a bit of wiggle room, but don't overdo it. Uh, so th that was the first group that said, no, we don't want... Um, we don't want the 90 millimeter M10. The other group that did not want the 90 millimeter M10 uh, was the tank destroyer branch. Uh, so Lieutenant Schaefer at tank destroyer branch filed a concurrence, a qualified concurrence, quote, 
with the understanding that this project is a development project only for the purpose of securing information with regards to the practicability of mounting the 90 millimeter onto the gun motor carriage M10. The gun is not desired by the tank destroyers as a tank destroyer weapon, since it is believed that the three inch gun has sufficient power. It is further felt that the gun motor carriage M10 is too heavy and too slow. So remember, TD Branch at this time, they, they're all in on the M18. They, they, they are viewing the M18 as exactly what they wanted uh, for, uh, for Tank Destroyer Branch. Uh, because it, it was very fast, it was very mobile, it, was, uh, it, it did the job. And the 76 millimeter gun worked. Uh, even when they were looking at putting the 90 into the 76 gun, they said, look, if you want to do this, yeah, we can. It works. We tested it. But you're going to be pulling stocks of a weapon that is currently working and is efficient out of service while you do this conversion to a 90 millimeter. So if you if you put the 90 millimeter onto a TD or onto a tank or whatever, you're, you're, so, you're getting a couple of problems here. First, you're reducing your ammunition load substantially. So uh, ammunition load, there was a requirement of 70 rounds of ammunition uh, that ETO had for a tank. Uh, and when the T26 came out, the E1, the, the original Pershing, uh, it only carried something like 45 rounds, 45, 48 rounds. This is unacceptable. So part of the reason of the delay of Pershing was it had to completely reconfigure the inside of the tank in order to get additional ammunition in that, that didn't fit because you just put a bigger gun on it. Uh, which is part of the reason that Pershing isn't quite as comfortable inside as the Sherman, and they, they wanted to get rid of the bow gunner, ETO wouldn't let them do that, and so on. Uh, you have a slower rate of fire as well. Uh, and if you look at, again, at some of the engagement reports from the uh, from the TD units, they don't fire just one shot and, and see what happens. I mean, they'll fire three or four shots rapidly at a target to make sure that, yeah, okay, we hit it the first time, but we really want to make sure it's dead. And they actually would combine high explosive of an AP so it wouldn't be un unusual to say, yeah, we, we fired four rounds of AP at this thing. We think we knocked it out, but then we fired another four rounds of HE at it just to make sure. And by, by the way, it's, it caught fire. Uh, and with the three-inch gun doing a, doing a good job, yeah, you had an issue firing Panthers from the front. How often did that really happen? Uh, so th if they're getting the kills with what they've got, what they've got is working there, this is why in 1943, 1944, there, there's not really much of a move for the 90 uh, until a little bit later in the war uh, when they start realizing, you know, maybe it would be a good idea to be able to take on Panthers and whatever from the front. Let's get a couple of these M36s in just in case. And that's why after Ju uh, July of 44, they were able to say, okay, look, bring those M36s over and they're in the field by September, as I recall, if those are the correct dates. And at the end of the war, though, isn't there a little bit with the Allies of them doing stuff because they can? I mean, just generally, aircraft, you know, tanks, weapons. We're through the dark days of 42, 41, 42, when we've not got enough of anything and we're struggling. And 44, 45, production's ramping up. Everything's going, working well. So there's a lot of things coming in that we, we can. We're doing just, again, because we can. You know, we can have a bigger one. We can have a faster one. Almost, almost doing what the Germans had been doing a couple of years earlier. With, with one difference, um, right. the Americans would would spend a lot of uh, a reasonable. I wouldn't say they, they didn't overdo it. They they had cullings, uh, such uh, such as the uh, the Special Armored Vehicle Board, uh, where look, we got too many projects. Uh, let's slim these down a bit. Uh, but the Americans were quite willing to put R and D in most cases. HVAP is an exception. Uh, to the let's work this let's let's try it out and see if it works or not and if it does work we'll keep it aside in our back pocket just in case we need it whereas the germans were oh crap we're losing we're desperate for any wunderwaffe this might work let's field it and we'll try it and and the the case in point that i use uh, for that is infrared uh, so the you know the germans are famously the first group to, to put infrared night fighting equipment on their tanks uh, on their uhus and their their panthers well, it's not as if 1940s, uh, you know, 1939, I think it was, even the, the Soviets were driving around with infrared on their BTs, and uh, the Americans certainly were driving around on their Sherman and testing in 42. The difference was that the Allies realized that it was a wasted effort. It didn't work, and it was not worth the, uh, the expense and effort for the very, very limited gain you were going to get of doing it. So they didn't bother. Where the Germans need every single possible benefit they could possibly get 
And if it worked, great. If it didn't work, well, we tried it. But in doing so, they uh, they expended their resources. So if you look at what happened to the like the first battalion of Panthers that had the night fighting equipment, uh, to quote Hillary Doyle, the Germans themselves realized very quickly it was useless, and they took them off. And they put the uh, to get the uh, the knife fighting the vampire uh, what's it the vampire I, I can't remember the equipment onto the panther you actually had to remove a couple of ammo bins and a few other things so they ended up taking those knife fighting gear off and putting the ammo bins back on again afterwards so uh, it, it was the the battle need doctrine was what army ground forces put it uh, so arm the engineers were not allowed to send the latest and greatest overseas just because they said it was the latest and greatest. Right. Uh, it had to be requested by the using arms at the other end. And the, the biggest example of this is the T-23 medium tank, which General Barnes, bless him, he was a genius, but he swore up and down that the T-23 medium tank was the replacement to the uh, was a replacement to the Sherman. It would be the tank that we would take with us to, to Europe in 1944, late 44, early 45. And he convinced somebody to build 250 of the bloody things. And they just sat around in the U.S. You know, being used a little bit for training, experimentation, familiarization. But it was an utter, utter waste. Uh, and that was part of the reason that uh, Army Ground Forces were a little bit gun shy about the T-26. Because th th there was this uh, slew of vehicles that the U.S. Ordnance Branch had developed that said, this is, this is great, it works. Varying from the M5 tank destroyer, the M7 medium tank um the the, the whatever I, I'd, I'd have them handy somewhere else the t23 was one of them and uh the american army is getting a little bit burned by this the, the engineers saying this works they try them out they build it for they realize no it don't work as anywhere near as well as they thought it did and uh, so they're, they're a bit once bitten twice shy and they flat refuse to, to gamble the great liberation of europe on something that the engineers are saying that they work. Yeah, they got a 90% track record that they do. But when you're talking about major end items like tanks and tank destroyers, they're going to be understandably a little bit cautious. Hmm. So David made a point about optics. Um, and, you know, we know it's come up in the sidebar. You're a big fan of the 76 millimeter, less keen on the 17 pounder. When we're getting to that kind of crucial part of the war, the 44 period onwards, wasn't it better to put effort into getting off the first shot, the first accurate shot, deploying your tank destroyer, whether it's a towed piece or a tracked piece in the right place, engaging the enemy at the right range and the right place with the right, you know, combined armors around you. Isn't all of that in many ways more important than actually what size gun it is? Yes. Uh, and, and again, that's why TDs didn't have a roof. <laughs> so you yeah. could see, you know, we could see the enemy faster. Uh, then you can go into yeah, you can go into the minor details of the specifications of the optics. Is it a clear optic? Is it an optic that gives you a wider field of vision versus a narrower field of vision? What's the magnification? But so again, and this this may be may simply have been fortunate after the fact versus a deliberate design decision. But you may have heard the uh, the average tank engagement range or tank on tank engagement range in the ETO in World War II was about 700 yards. Yeah, yeah, John John Buckley went through with that with us uh, a few months ago. And it, it, it all now, the top he, Trump's versions of-, of um, Did he distinguish you know, between the average range and the median range? I cannot recall. Uh, because the average age range is skewed by a couple of two kilometer engagements. Right. The median range was about 500 yards. Right. A full third of engagements were under 300 yards. Wow. Your your magnification, your zoom is even your range estimation. I mean, you you you're battle site. You're you're not even bothering to say target 300 yards because you you're not moving the you're not moving the reticle on the, uh, the reticle on the target. You you quite literally point shoot fire, uh, and uh, there's a. Uh, um, I have a couple of graphs, and it compares between the British Rangers, the American Rangers, and so on. And there's also a graph that states how many uh, how many tanks were actually engaged in whatever it was that shot them, and it was like twelve percent. the 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 vast, overwhelming amount of of tanks that were destroyed were destroyed by things that they had no idea were out there. And I strongly suspect aviators are going to say the same thing: your your, your aviation kills are enemy pilots that don't know you're there. Now, that was Western Front. 
And the, uh, the army looked at it and they did their statistical analysis. I don't understand the mathematics, uh, but they said that the reason for these very short ranges was because of the terrain, not because of training or anything else. So whether this would have worked on the Eastern front in the mm. open steps where you genuinely could see a kilometer or two routinely, well, that's an open question. Uh, and I don't have the data to answer that. So you can say, yeah, the, I mean, I, I think it's probably fair to say that you know, a panther with its higher optics and its flatter trajectory probably would have an advantage over a Western tank in the steps. But then again, you get into the whole top trumps question. Well, okay, well, why is the American tank out there on his all by his lonesome and not supported by the, the battalion of M7 howitzers or, you know, the Army Air Force or whatever else it is up there? So. I mean, that's the thing, you know, as I live in Normandy, I can drive anybody around and I can go to a, a village and say, here's where, let's say, long range worked. And then I can drive two, two kilometers away and start park somewhere else and say, and a day later, here's where short range worked or here's where ambush worked and here's where surprise worked. And, and the thing is, as you move around, there is no consistency, really. There's so many variables. And, you know, and I often just say, as I say, first shot wins. You know, first accurate shot usually counts for a lot. Sergeant Dring in Fontenay Le Penel knocking out the first couple of targets with his regular regular 75. You know, it, 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 it wasn't this idea that, oh, you can't knock out a tiger, you can't poke out a Panzer IV. We're, we're going down that rabbit hole of, of tank on tank stuff now, where we should be talking about tank destroyers. But, um, uh, any more thoughts about the data that we have from 44 or 43, 45, sort of skewing our opinions about what tank destroyers could do today in 2023? 20, um, okay, so tank destroyers, when, when they went away, um, they went away as a branch. Yeah, sure, get it. Uh, it, was, it, it was deemed unnecessary, but they never went away either as concept or as a vehicle. So if you looked at, let's say, a 1979 American infantry battalion, you, you've got you know, your four line companies, A, B, C, and D, and then there's an Echo Company. And your Echo Company is M901 ITVs, improved tow vehicles. These are the things that have a little elevating missile launcher, twin missiles. And you know this is back in the days of the, uh, of the M113 before the Bradley came around with its own tows. This is a vehicle whose which is purpose designed to engage enemy armor at longer ranges. It's lightly armed, or lightly armored, I'm sorry, itself. So it's relatively mobile. Um, okay, I get it. An M901 relatively mobile is itself a relative term. Uh, but it's an example of the vehicle. There are, there are other vehicles that, were, that were equally went around as tank destroyers. Uh, you have got the uh, Jägerpanzer Kanona or the, uh, the Rakuten Jägerpanzers, uh, which went all the way through till the, uh, till the 1980s. Uh, these are all. Uh, even even a jeep with a 107 millimeter recordless rifle. The only, the main purpose for that is to destroy to, uh, destroy armor. Yeah. So you 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 have the the vehicles kept going. Um. And actually, on that, I go go back to the the people on shore discussion about it. You know, did the stronger shots go away? So what the hell is the the MPF that the army is building now, or the Striker MGS that just went away? These are assault guns by by, by any term. Uh, as far as the doctor idea of having a, a battalion-sized organization of very fragile but very mobile vehicles designed to meet enemy armored thrusts and basically wipe out the tanks and go away somewhere else, that is an attack helicopter battalion of Apaches from 1980. I mean, that's what it was, that's why it was created. Uh, so I, I, I don't think the, the doctrine has changed just a mechanism with which the doctrine is being uh, is carried out. We've got a great question here from Samuel Thompson. Could the chieftain describe a typical doctrinal encounter between an American tank destroyer company and a German panzer company in Northwest Europe? How do the combined arms complement each other? I don't know if there was a typical encounter between a TD company and a panzer company. But in theory, in in what what are they um, what are they training people to do in advance? What are they expecting to meet? Well, in theory, if if the enemy has uh, has broken through, and, and and again, I can only think of like in Western Europe, I can only think of the Belgian Mortain as cases in point. Um, the there will be an advanced recon body to, to identify exactly where the vehicles or the TDs, because you know, Mortain they were towed guns as often as not, should set up. 
uh, they are supposed to use artillery fire to strip away uh, the the accompanying infantry and then engage the tanks, which themselves, because you're under artillery fire, you'll have buttoned up, so you're going to reduce your own vision as well. If that actually happened, I don't know. Um, it's also worth noting that the TD uh, um, MTO changed after their initial experience. It was originally, there was it was very heavy on not just the guns. You had the anti-aircraft guns that was mentioned by your guest there on, I think it was Monday. Yep. Um, it, but also it had they had their own engineers. They had their own security platoons. They had their uh, reconnaissance units. They were, they were really quite well equipped. Uh, a lot of those assets were taken away uh, mid-war. Uh, for two reasons, I guess. One, I guess they realized they didn't, didn't need them as badly as they thought they did. And B, holy crap, we're running out of infantrymen. We can't have these guys to get near to hell with just the TDs. We can't have the infantry sitting with the TDs uh, waiting for something to happen when we have all these holes that we need to fill in 4th Infantry Division uh, or you know, whatever division is taking hits at that particular moment in time. So uh, I, I suspect that there was an element of the doctrine that didn't match uh, reality, even before you get to the idea that a lot of the TDs were simply split up and penny packeted out. Um, and, and again, I'm looking at the Hornets uh, uh, AAR and they said, oh yeah, w when we were attached to somebody, uh, the owning division, because you know, you'd always be a subordinate, you would be a company commander talking to a brigade commander or a division commander. They would say, I want a gun here, I want a gun here, I want a gun here, I want a gun here. And the Germans were complaining exactly the same as the American TD crews were complaining, that they weren't being allowed any freedom of action to deploy and use the guns in the manner that they had been trained. They're being directed by higher ranking personnel. You will set up your gun there. Whether you know It may have made sense to the higher ranking personnel, but it may not necessarily have made sense to the TD crewmen. Then there's what there's one of the tank destroyer units in near near Mortan. I think they not only changed the division it was attached to twice in one week. I think it changed corps twice in one week as well. It went from seventh corps to eighth corps, then back to seventh corps, and you know, and you know, within a week. But a rather obvious question, but it is a cool one. Mad Cat is asking best tank destroyer of World War Two. Probably the M eighteen. I mean, realistically, especially if you look at the way it was designed. I mean, the M10 was a bodge. And as as your your chap, was it Dan, on Monday was saying, there, there were M10 right. crewmen that loved their M10s and flat refused. Uh, one battalion uh, flat refused to convert to M18s because they liked their M10s so much. Uh, so, you, yeah, you've got that argument. Uh, but I think as far as the tank destroyer goes, uh, the M18 is fine. There, there was a there was another question I saw here for a second. Um, let me scroll up. Uh, yeah, Peorhom, um, he, he mentions towed anti-tank guns saved the, the day, being manhandled when vehicles could not go, being able to hide yeah. hell harder to knock out. Now, uh, the example of Anzio was brought up at TD Branch. Again, I, I found this in the archives. There was a... There, uh, the British were on the northern flank, the Americans uh, to their right, uh, the British had towed 17-pounders, the Americans had M10s. And in one of the many German attacks, uh, the entire British anti-tank battalion was lost, and the Americans only lost two M10s, because the M10s could just go into reverse and leave, whereas the, the towed guns that the British had, you, know, you couldn't do that. They were wiped out to a man, uh, which is part of the reason why these towed AT guns... Um, went away now yes it is true towed anti-tank guns would save the day often enough and again more time is the case in point but yeah. the question that isn't answered by that statement is would a self-propelled unit have done the same job just as well or better uh, or survived more in in the accomplishment and i suspect it's very similar to the the, the final nail in the coffin of horse cavalry in the u.s army yeah, horse cab, you did fantastic in the 1941 maneuvers. You were sitting in Patton's rear end, and you were, you, you were basically roaming around Patton's rear. But a mechanized unit could have done it as well. So the fact that you were successful is not evidence that you were still the best answer. And Mortan is complicated because Mortan is probably an exception to the rule in that the whole setup of that battle is against the run of play in the Normandy campaign. I mean, Lutic was the only sizable German counterattack, although it was a load of old bollocks. But the fact that they found themselves in Mortan and Sam Button, I mean, that's not how 
the battle had been going the previous two months in Normandy. So like Aracor came up in the conversation earlier as well about a really good, and it came up yesterday or the day before about tank destroyers. Are they are really cool battles? Mortal and Aracor, really great battles to talk about. But are they are they exceptions to the rule that that, that prove a point? That's the that's that would be my thing. I can think of occasions in in Normandy of towed artillery, like German artillery you just mentioned, being knocked out really quickly. Uh, I think there was one somewhere just for five miles north of San Lo from memory where an American towed anti-tank unit just got knocked out by an enemy they didn't even see. I think it was I think it was heavy barrel mortars that knocked them out or something. So for all the, the sometimes they can do well, but equally they can do really badly. Yeah, it, it's a case of uh, it, it's a victory or death. <laughs> it's yeah. basically where yeah. you are with a toad AD gun. I mean, you, you play you play computer games like Combat Mission or whatever, and you're like, Aha, I'm going to set up my 8.8 .8 up here with this brilliant field of fire. And it's kind of, okay, you're going to see first, you're going to shoot first, but once you fire that big 8.8, .8, everybody with line of sight to you is going to know where you are. And, oh, yeah, you're way too big to pick up and run. Uh, so it's it's one of those balances by the end of the one again then when it, then you get the Panzerfaust and you get the bazooka yeah the rangers are short but it's a hell of a lot more survivable and we got a good question about the cavalry groups because we did a show about the cavalry groups and i've completely forgotten the name of the guest the guy who wrote the book about the cavalry groups in the in the ardennes did they stick to tank destroyers clo uh, the doctrine closer than the tank destroyers because uh, cavalry groups do a lot of the things that you were talking about in those six seven points the germans made back in the 20s of fast mobile moving in mass figure filling in gaps being cheaper to produce than tanks so cavalry groups are another variant of the tank destroyer issue that aren't tank destroyers but come into the same kind of category what what's your quick response I'm, I'm to that to think how, how tank destroyers group, groups were were occasionally used in the defense so for example at saint vith there was a td group in between the saint vith uh, the 106 and the unit whatever unit was to their left it was a cavalry group that was holding the line but i think it was more of an economy of force mission than it was a mobile defense um i don't know if i actually can answer your question I, I mean, yeah, they liked the M18 because it was fast uh, and it could keep up with them as opposed to the M10s, but I, no, I, I don't know if I can say anything specific about the TD doctrine per se. I okay. haven't looked into it, honestly. Um, so I think we're going to, we will bring things to an end fairly soon, but any other things you think should be said about tank destroyers that we have yet to say this week on World War II TV? Uh, there, there was a, question a couple of days ago on the 57 millimeter, why the 57 millimeter wasn't used. And, uh, it, it was, it was obviously trialed by both TD branch and armor, uh, TD, Br uh, armor branch got rid of it. It was on the M7 medium. And then it went up to the 50, uh, 75 armor branch got rid of it because it was pointless as a high explosive thrower compared to the 75 you know if you're going to use a gun to throw high explosive do proper high explosive t branch got rid of it because in their estimation at the time most combat would occur at ranges in excess of 500 yards and because it is a smaller lighter projectile it's going to lose velocity faster than the big 75s which is why td branch kept with the 75 until uh, the 76 and three inch came along and they didn't use the six pounder now, it turned out after the fact that, A, they developed new six-pounder ammunition that, that, that was pretty damn powerful at long range, uh, and, B, that the ranges were actually shorter than anticipated. So the only 57-millimeter tank destroyers were the T-48s, and they went to the UK and the Soviet Union. Uh, but I, I just wanted to answer that one question. The other one was on HFAP versus Sabo. The problem with Sabo yeah. is that Americans found it to be unacceptably inaccurate. Uh, and, again, this is, this is one of those differences of philosophy the, the americans were willing to take sacrifices in some areas uh, such as ergon uh, such as gunpowder in order to gain reliability or ergonomics which is why the americans hated firefly uh, and the british loved them you know, which is the correct answer is it the correct answer to get that extra penetration or is it the correct answer to get that extra ergonomic and variety and I have my opinion, but that is my opinion. I am not the British Army and its doctrinaires. So uh, the British accepted the inaccuracy of Sabo in order to get the higher penetration of closer range. Yeah, the Americans, Cause, cause it came up that quite a few people on the sidebar, in, not just this week, but previously, yeah, they, they claim they're British people 
that the six pounder is the best anti tank gun of World War II, which is, of course, the 57. For those who are watching who aren't familiar with this, but is it is it the gun they're talking about, or is it the ammunition? Again, it's down to the heat, sabo, that kind of thing. So, is are they talking about uh, is their preference for the weapon or the ammunition? Or well, you, you, have, you have to look at the whole system. system. Why, why was the standard U.S. Army anti-tank gun all the way through World War II, the 57? It's not as if the Americans didn't have bigger guns. Uh, I mean, you, you, there, were, there were towed mounts for the 75, for example. Uh, but I, I think it's because of the fact that it was still small enough that you can manhandle the bloody thing, that, that you could give it to light infantry and that they could use it. Uh, and it was still effective enough against enough targets that you know, not every target on the battlefield is going to be a panther. And if you're shooting at half tracks, or if you're shooting at Panzer IVs, or if you're shooting at a bunch of other things, 57 millimeter is plenty good enough. I think um, it was John. I think it was John Buckley found a report in the British archives based on the the stamina of loaders. In that, if you're repeatedly loading, for example, a 75 millimeter shell or a 57 millimeter shell, or you're loading 90 millimeter shells, how long can you keep picking up? And loading 90 millimeter shows and that again i think i think it was john bucket the data showed that a soldier an artilleryman tank destroyer whatever tank whatever the fuck you call him will work longer picking up and handling 57 to 75 but once you get to 90 he just gets muscle fatigue much quicker and that was another variable that i thought that's really fascinating because you know you get these things aren't loaded mechanics it's not naval guns that some fucking gadget yeah. puts it in it's some poor sword picking it up well, not only picking it up, but is he picking it up standing comfortably, or is he going to be half crawling because the enemy are shooting yeah. at you, and you, you're in this kind of bizarre crouch position where you, your back is going to kill you while you while you crawl over to the round and shove the round in? Uh, so it it, it, it it just the variables in this conversation are 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 endless, and the opinions are endless, and we will bring things in because you are officially on your lunch break, and I we will we will hold off and we'll bring it. We'll bring you back again and carry on this conversation in some other shape or form. Oh, we're we we're that. expecting that we're not going to draw any conclusions, but you've given us your favorite um, anti, uh, tank destroyer. You've kind of given us an assessment of what the role of a tank destroyer is, and and that's as far as I think we should take it. So Fair before enough. we go, what are you up to? What what's what are your latest projects? What are you working on? What are, what's what's next for you? um next set of videos so that, i mean i got like three jobs i got i got my side youtube gig i've got wargaming and i've got uh, the army so the army the army's keeping me very busy the last couple of months and the next in the entire month of april i'm gone uh, i can't say what necessarily um the you can expect that i'm going to be in boston march the 8th uh so we're talking about doing an evening out at the american heritage museum up there uh, I've got a couple of videos in the works on Apache gunnery. They invited me out to uh, to see what happens at an age 64 gunnery. I have concluded that I, it is just as well I got a fixed wing license, not a helicopter license, because I killed myself very quickly in the simulator. Um, it, life continues. I mean, I, I've, I've got the family and summer holidays coming up. And yeah, it's, it's another day, another dollar, really. Well, great. Well, we'll leave things there, Chieftain. So it's been great talking to you. People said we have great chemistry, so we'll have to get a band together or something. That'll be really cool. Um, folks, yeah, we're back yeah. tomorrow with Peter Knight. Philip Knight is going to be talking about the um, the Crusader gun tractor, which will, again, is it, a, is it a tank destroyer? Is it an artillery piece? We'll find all about that, but he'll be able to give us information about the Archer and the M10 as well, and lots of technical drawings. That'll be great. So, folks, thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for the new patrons I've had the last couple of days and the channel members. And if you haven't already found the Chieftain's channel, the link is in the description below, but he's 10 times bigger than me. So I'm sure you have. So cheers, everybody. Thank you, Chieftain. Thank you for watching. This is Paul Woodhead for World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.